I've been working in alarm management for about 15 years. I've been with Max Solutions and Solutions PT for about nine years, and I worked for ABB as an alarm management consultant for about seven years prior to that. I've worked in the process industry since 1980. Yes, I've had a hard paper round. Uh, so I've worked for Emerson, who was Fisher Controls at the time. I used to install, commission, write software for control systems. So I've got a lot of uh, experience within the control systems. Last 15 years, I've focused on alarm management. So today's talk is about why alarm management is important. So without further ado, let's crack on with the presentation. OK, you may not be as bad as this and be subject to your plant going on fire, exploding or polluting the, the environment and killing fish. You may not be this bad, but it has been widely recognized uh, that poorly designed alarm systems are contributory factors in many high profile instrument incidents. If you look on the HSC website under the Human Factors Alarm Management Factor, uh, state, uh, web page, you'll find this statement about the role of poorly designed alarm systems in major incidents. They refer to the Milford Haven uh, explosion and fires where the operators had five hours of alarms just going off once every couple of seconds. So that's in there. Alarm management, it does affect places. And of course, apart from being involved in high profile incidents or any incident at all, managing your alarms reduces unnecessary plant outages, which I'm sure companies would be happy with that, makes our plants safer, more productive. And of course, if you manage your alarms, you keep your product quality in spec. Why do we need to manage alarms? If you don't do anything, your performance of your system will deteriorate. Things will get worse. Alarms will proliferate because you're not managing the systems. People come in, make changes. They don't document them and things just get worse and worse. Your alarm system doesn't improve. And of course, if you uh, come under the attention of any of the regulators, the HSC, the Environment Agency, enforcement uh, is a possibility, uh, ultimately prosecution if you don't do what they require you to do. And of course, you guys listening, you might think, OK, oh, I've got things are really bad. My alarm situation hopefully isn't, but maybe it is. You're not unique. If we look at some of those high profile incidents that you may or may not have heard of, I'm sure most people will have for 47 years. These things have been going on since control systems started controlling plants instead of huff and puff pneumatic stuff and operators operating manual controls. Uh, we've had lots of incidents where alarms or the lack of alarms have been in, uh, implicated. So do you have a legislative requirement to manage your alarms? If you are coma regulated, if you fall under the coma regulations, yes. Under the coma 2015 update in Schedule 2, Regulation 7, the following matters, the paragraph here, the following matters must be addressed by safety management system. And in the second paragraph, paragraph one there, it says and for alarm management. So under the coma regulations, you have to manage your alarms. You must address alarm management. It's not a should, could, maybe, perhaps, if I can be bothered. You must do that if you fall under the coma regulations. So if you don't manage your alarms, apart from not complying with uh, legislation, if you fall under coma regs, a poorly managed alarm system could lead to harm to the people, environment, your assets, your reputation. You might end up with regulatory intervention. So you've got improvement notices from the HSE or the Environment Agency. If things are really bad, perhaps even prohibition notices stop you producing until you actually deal with things. You could have large fines. You could have unwanted media coverage, such as Deepwater Horizon. BP was slated globally for the, the oil rig disaster in the Mexican Gulf. It wasn't all their fault, but it was attracted a huge amount of global coverage. Loss of revenue. You have unplanned outages because alarms are just not being managed correctly. So if you have unplanned outages, your product quality goes off. 
you're going to lose customers. You're going to lose money because if you can't make the right product at the right time, at the right quality, your customers will go elsewhere. And of course, there's workplace stress. If you have far too many alarms and your alarm system is going off all the time, your operators become stressed. And I actually did an assessment at one plant to power station where I opened a cupboard and there was a shelf full of paracetamol and ibuprofen tablets. I said, what's going on here, guys? They said, you can hear the alarm going off 24 hours a day here. You've only been here a few hours. We have this day after day. We go home with headaches. We go home stressed because of all these alarms. And workplace stress is not a place companies want to go to. If you have your stressed operator and they decide, I can't take it anymore, you guys have 10, 25, 30 years experience. They go off on the sick. And how do you replace that guy with all that knowledge and experience? You can't explain, you can't explain your plant, you can't bring in somebody at 10 minutes notice. You've got to shuffle people around, which makes them more stressed. If you don't manage your alarms, I can't tell you how much it will cost to manage your alarms because I don't know how much work you need to do, what equipment you need to buy. I could go through individually and work out with you, but I, off the top of my head, I can't tell you how much it would cost, but I can tell you how much it might cost if you don't. For example, here's a, a, a case of a water company that were fined 20 million pounds in 2017. They were repeat offenders. During the trial, you can see statements, alarm going off for days on end. When the judge summed up, he said, I have to make the fine sufficiently large they get the message. It shouldn't be cheaper to offend than take the appropriate cautions. Uh, and of course, the shareholders had to pay. It wasn't allowed to put the price of water bills up. So they were fined £20 million. Lots of reasons, but they were repeat offenders. Another case, a steel company was fined a million pounds. In sentencing, the judge identified failed alarms on a water pump, lack of control uh, staff in the control cabin. So they didn't have people to actually acknowledge the alarms because they're out on the plant. So not having enough operators was an issue. And again, failures of relating the absence of proper and effective alarms, acutely serious. Large companies must expect to pay heavy fines even when there's a challenging climate. So don't think you can get away and say, oh, we haven't got enough money. If you don't manage and you don't deal with things and there are incidents, you get prosecuted, you can expect to pay a lot of money. Now, I might hear, I don't know who everyone is on the call, I might hear some of you say, we're not a regulated industry. Coma doesn't apply to us. We don't have anything like that. And we've only got really low alarm numbers. So we don't have a problem. However, what I'm going to tell you is if you fail to manage your alarms, you're not really in control of your process. If you're not managing alarms, which we'll talk about alarm management, what it means in a second, you're not in control of how changes are made. Your system integrator will come in and do what he wants to do the way he's always done it. And you're not going to have a sensible alarm system. It's not going to manage your plant correctly. So if you don't manage your alarms, you're not in control of your process. Who is in control of your process? Your operator. Who's the most important person on the plant? Your operator. Your site manager might think he is or she is or they are. However, they're not. They are not the ones that stop your plant from shutting down and losing money. They're not the ones that manage the plant and modify the process to make sure your quality is OK. The person that does that is your operator. So your operator is your most important person. So your operator, alarm management is really important. You need to manage your alarms. Otherwise, you have loss of revenue. You have issues with uh, permits, uh, uh, consequences, uh, consents, uh, environmental consents, perhaps. What kind of challenges does your operator face? Let's have a look at the challenges, typical challenges. Too many alarms, wrongly prioritized alarms. If you remember anything about Milford Haven incident, that was one of the uh, things that the HSE brought out. Too many wrongly prioritized alarms. Inadequate tag names, confusing descriptors, use of capital letters all over the place. The guys don't understand what things are, what they're meant to be. Uh, the descriptors mean nothing. What's this? I don't know. I just acknowledge the alarm. 
inadequate differentiation between priorities. So they have red text all the way down the page, which is a high priority, a low priority. I don't know. It's all the same color. The sounds, it only goes boop for every alarm. That's all it does. I don't know. When I'm distracted, is that high priority? Is it low priority? And pages of standing alarms. I've got loads of alarms to look through when I need to find things. Nuisance alarms that are happening all the time. They mean I just keep acknowledging the alarm. I don't really look at things. I miss things because of it, because I've got nuisance alarms that I don't need or haven't been repaired. Poorly designed process graphics. I can't find my way around the hierarchy. I've got a lot of alarm colors on there mixed in with all sorts of other colors for pipe work and valves and pumps. I don't know where to identify the alarms easily. So there's a lot of challenges. Your operators, who are the most important person on the plant, there are a lot of challenges they need to deal with. So a you, an American president once said, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. I'm sure you're all thinking, what's that got to do with alarm management? Well, what if I was to change the wording to say, ask not what your operator can do for you, but what you can do for your operator? Think of it that way. So what can we do? How do we solve the problems? We manage alarms. By managing alarms, you help your operator, which helps your process, your plant and your business. So you need to manage alarms. So what is alarm management? If we look in the definitions in the EMUA guidelines and the uh, international standards, I've got 62682, the IEC standard here, ISA 18.2 has similar definition. The definition is alarm management is about processes and practices for everything to do with documenting, determining, designing, monitoring, maintaining alarm systems. So you'll see the definitions are virtually identical. Uh, the standards came after the EMUA guidelines and were based on the EMUA guidelines. So it's about processes and practices, not just the numbers. The numbers are important, but it's about everything that goes around to support making sure your alarms are correct. Where do you start? First thing you need to do is do a benchmark assessment, which looks at everything to do with alarm management. You have roles and responsibilities defined. What are your alarm numbers, training and competence, documentation, everything, your environmental responsibilities, any regulatory compliance issues you may have. You look at everything. That's what an external assessor would do. Somebody like me. Uh, it's better to have an external assessment, and of course I would say that, because I will highlight things that perhaps somebody doing an internal assessment might say, mm, I should have done that a couple of years ago. I won't mention that, I'll just get on and do it. And maybe things are missed. So do a benchmark, find out how good, bad or indifferent your management of alarms is, and do a gap analysis. The first thing you need to do before you start managing alarms, having identified what you need to do, is develop an alarm philosophy. And the alarm philosophy is the document, as it says here, that establishes how you are going to manage alarms. This is your philosophy. How will you do it? From everything to who's responsible, how we're going to train people, how we're going to modify things. Everything is in your alarm philosophy. It's quite a hefty document. It includes sections such as the definition of an alarm. What does an alarm actually, what is it? What uh, A valve limit switch, an open and closed limit switch is not an alarm, it's an event. If you have a failure of a valve to open or close, and that's the same for ESDs, it's the same for blowdowns. If an ESD fails to close, you wanna know. If it closes normally, you don't. Same with blowdowns when they open. It includes an alarm prioritization methodology that's referenced in your alarm philosophy. So you prioritize your alarms in a proper method, a formal methodology based generally on consequence and time to respond. What will happen if the alarm is missed? How long do you have to respond? An alarm rationalization methodology that's in your alarm philosophy or an external document referenced from your alarm philosophy. How are you going to determine how you rationalize alarms? HMI design guidelines, the colors of alarms, the sounds, etc. They're all in there. 
the kind of sections you need to have, your alarm philosophy. If you look in the standards, this is taken from IS, IEC 62682. There's a similar chart a table in ISA 18.2. This tells you all the sections you need to have in your alarm philosophy. As I said, it's quite a hefty document, but you need to have all these things in there. So, <clears throat> once you have an alarm philosophy, you've got to robustly enforce it and make sure that people do things the way you want to do as defined in your alarm philosophy. What about operations? Yep, they need to know about that. Who else needs to know? Site configuration teams, control system vendors, system integrators. How am I going to design and prioritize my alarms? How am I going to display them? These people doing your configuration, they need to understand this is what you require. You don't get what, well, we always do it this way. It's easier and cheaper. No, this is what I require. Package vendors and project personnel. Extremely important that all of these people must understand the requirements of your alarm philosophy and comply with the requirements of your alarm philosophy. In addition to your alarm philosophy, you need two important tools, something to measure and analyze your alarm system and a master alarm database. At Max Solutions, uh, the software for performance measurement is called Process View Analyzer. Here we can see the alarm rate. We can look at the top 10 alarms. We can do all that kind of analysis, reporting, etc. That's our software Process View Analyzer. We also sell Process View Guardian, which is a master alarm database where you compile all a list of all your configured alarms, all the configuration attributes into a SQL database. In the SQL database, we have a prioritization wizard which helps you prioritize your alarm. This wizard is based on the prioritization methodology defined in your alarm philosophy. So you've got to have your alarm philosophy first. And because we use a database for Guardian, not a spreadsheet, don't use spreadsheets. We have a full audit trail of every single change you make, who made it, when they made it. That's a really important thing for your management of change. So you need two important tools. So you've got an alarm philosophy, you've got your tool to do your KPIs and performance measurement, and you've got an alarm database, master alarm database. How does that actually help your operators, you think? OK, let's have a look at the challenges we noted earlier. We had too many alarms and wrongly prioritized alarms. OK. Alarm rationalization would reduce the number of alarms. Generally, it could be anywhere between 40 and 60 percent. You might find on plants. I've been there. Got rid of a whole host of alarms that were not alarms. Wrongly prioritized alarms. Alarm rationalization. Part of rationalization is prioritizing your alarm as well as documenting the cause of the alarm, what happens if you miss it, what the operator action is. So it's all alarm prioritization, alarm rationalization. It's in your alarm philosophy. Inadequate tag names and confusing descriptors. What's what happens there? Why is that important? OK, this is from a SCADA system in the Midlands uh, about four or five years ago. The guy configuring these were tag names, OG PLC V12714. I said, what on earth is that? I know what it is. It's a file card channel. It was actually to do with the pressure in a reactor. It was reactor pressure and the descriptor was reactor pressure. Great. The only problem is they had seven reactors. So we had V12714 reactor pressure, V15813 reactor pressure, which reactor? The operator didn't know and the tag name meant nothing to them. He also included alarm in his tag names. I said, this valve limit switch is not an alarm, it's an event. So we're going to have to change the tag name of all the tag names you've put alarm against and we're going to have to take away, we're going to have to update every single tag name where you've used alarm. That's ridiculous. I said, he said, it helps me find where I am in the configuration where I make changes. My response to that was, I don't care if it takes you five minutes or five days to find where you are in the configuration, but if it takes the operator five minutes to understand what this tag is all about, potentially an incident may have happened.
So if it takes you five days, I don't care. I'd sack you for incompetence, which you didn't like, but it doesn't matter. The important person, remember your operator. Think about your operator. Here's a one from a, a SCADA system in Kazakhstan I did about four years ago. Remotely, I didn't visit. Uh, the tag name in red is hidden in the middle of a graphical hierarchy. The operator doesn't need to know that. He knows the screen he's on. He needs to know the tag name. And they tell him the data's from PLC A. The operator doesn't care about that. He just wants to know what the tag name is, what the alarm is. I mentioned descriptors. Make sure your descriptors correctly describe things. And if you use abbreviations, use them consistently. Here are nine different abbreviations for a contact breaker, circuit breaker, that I found in a power station in Northern Ireland a few years ago. They had nine definitions of our abbreviation. That was just for one type of tag. They had lots and lots of different variations. If you use abbreviations, use the same abbreviation all the time. Even if there's space to use the whole word, don't use it, use the abbreviation because the operator has to remember all these different things. So inadequate tag names, you will have a tagging philosophy in your HMI design guidelines referenced from your alarm philosophy. Confusing descriptors, HMI design guidelines, put in a list of acceptable abbreviations, not the kind of things that your system integrator thinks is a great idea. And you've got three guys working on it with three different abbreviations. Document it. Use of capital letters, I've mentioned this. Can you imagine an operator that has five, six, seven pages of standing alarms? What difference does capital letters make? I'm sure that some of you, maybe all of you, will have seen things on the internet or read in the papers. If you can read this, you're a genius. Okay, I'm sorry to disappoint you. You're not all geniuses. You read the paragraph and you're, I can read that. If you look at the paragraph very closely, you might find the odd letter is missing or back to front. You might find a word like and, or, if, not is missing but you can still read the paragraph and understand it. Why? Because we actually read by pattern recognition. And that's something that the lady and gentleman who designed the font for motorway signs in the early 50s and road signs understood. We read by pattern recognition, which is why all these signs for motorways and roads use a title case, capital letter, lowercase, capital letter, lowercase. They recognize that if you're driving down a motorway at 70 miles an hour, you look at a sign which is all in capital letters. It takes you longer to read it and understand it. It takes your attention from the road. You might crash. You might miss your turn off. Something bad might happen. It's the same with alarms. It's going to take the guys just that little bit longer to read everything. So please make sure you don't use capital letters. It's very easy for configurers because you turn caps lock on and go type, type, type. It's much more difficult to do it properly. Shift capital letter, lowercase type. Shift capital letter, lowercase type. Much easier if I just do all capital letters. It's easy for me configuring. It's dreadful for your operator. Get rid of capital letters, guys. Get rid of that. Make sure it's in your design guidelines. Don't accept your system integrator, your vendor, giving you all capital letters. What about nuisance alarms? Alarms that aren't alarms. Rationalization, as I said, you're going to get rid of alarms you don't need. And with your software for performance measurement, you're going to measure and analyze and look at alarms that are nuisances. You're going to try and remediate these and get rid of them. I've been to places where they look at things and I look and say, God, that's terrible. Look at the alarm rate you've got. They say, oh, it's just the same last month and the month before and the month before that. And I said, OK, you report on a monthly basis. Do you do anything? We don't have time, uh, but we report. No, guys, if you report and you should be reporting, take action. Deal with the things, deal with the problems. What about different priorities, differentiation between priorities? You've got alarm prioritization methodology and your HMI design guidelines. You're not going to have a page of red 
text, you're going to have red, orange, yellow, whatever the alarm priorities are that you decide. That's going to be in your design guidelines. That's what you want your system integrator, your control system vendor to deliver. Inadequate enunciation, we've got that in your HMI design guidelines. You may have an alarm, a priority one alarm that goes whoop, whoop, whoop. Great, fantastic, that's priority one. Priority two or priority three, go boop, and it's gone. That's no good. You need to have reliable sounds that are repeatable, that can be understood. You can differentiate between the different priorities. So if I, the operator is temporarily distracted, he knows if it goes boop, 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 it's not too important. If it goes woo, woo, he knows he's got to react. He has to take his attention back to the alarms. So look at that. Make sure it's in your design guidelines. Poorly designed process graphics using alarm colors for static elements. Poorly designed alarm uh, graphics. That was also one of the issues noted by the HSE in the Milford Haven uh, explosion and fires. What about poorly designed graphics? What goes on with that? Here's a graphic I pinched off the internet. It's not one I configured, fortunately. What do we see on there? We see a lot of red. We see red is a high priority alarm. We use red for that. There's a lot of red on there. OK, so what's going on on that screen? Can we see where there are alarms? OK, we've got red pipes. We've got red valves. We've got red pumps. And you might think, OK, we know the pipes. That's not an issue. The valves aren't flashing, but there could be an alarm. There might not be an alarm. The pump could be stopped or it could be an alarm because it's red. Or, of course, it could be running. Because if you think about it, DCS systems, and I used to use this convention, it was the way I was taught, configuring, red is stop and green is run. If you think traffic light, red is stop, do not continue. Green is go. But if you're an electrical person and you go to electrical cabinets and you have electrical graphics designed for electrical people, red means running. So your traffic light says stop i.e. pump is stopped, danger. It's dangerous to go past that. From an electrical point of view, red is danger. Don't poke your fingers in because it's energized. Green is it's safe to poke your finger in. It's de-energized. So on that graphic, pumps could be started, they could be stopped, or they could be an alarm. How's the operator meant to understand that? OK, it's been, they've been working with the graphics all the time. Don't worry about it. They understand you're not thinking about your operator. So consider grayscale graphics to resolve that issue. So poorly designed graphics, alarm colors, keep them for alarms. Don't use them for static elements. Routine measurement and reporting, remedial action. You're going to deal with those kind of things as well. So. Don't forget management of change. In all of this, we're talking about making sure your graphics and your alarms are correct. Don't forget management of change. It's really important. I did a benchmark assessment four weeks ago. One of the issues that was brought to my attention was a graphic showing four air compressors. Well, great. That looks nice. Only two of those air compressor, only two air compressors were actually in operation. Number four. And number five, on the graphic, we saw one, two, three, and four. Only four was working. Number five was existed and running, but wasn't on the graphic. Number one, two, and three had been removed as part of a project, an improvement project, about two, three, four years earlier. They'd been removed, physically removed, but the graphics still existed and the alarms still existed and were standing. Pump number five, compressor number five, wasn't shown on the graphic at all. OK, so how was that project signed off? How was management of change? How did that work without updating the logic, without updating the graphics and the alarms? Oh, the operator knows those pumps aren't there. He knows the one that's there that's running isn't shown. Oh, well, they know that. Don't worry about it. How would you explain that to the HSE if they came in with an incident and said, oh, well, the air compressors were part of the problem? 
show me the grape compressors. Yeah, well, there's the graphic. Um, the one that stopped and tripped, yeah, that's not actually on there uh, because that well, that was about three, four years ago we put that in, but we don't show the operators. What about these three? Oh, they were taken out years ago. How would that look to the HSC? Do you think they'd be very happy with that? I don't think they would. So think about management of change. Make sure it works correctly. Make sure your P&IDs are updated. How many times do I go to site? Things are on a P&ID. Oh, I don't think that exists anymore. Did we not take that away? Oh, yeah, OK. Well, it doesn't matter, does it? So that's why I say when you do your alarm philosophy, make sure your project people are involved. Make sure they understand they have to comply. Make sure your logic and graphics are correct. Again, the system I worked on, they had two trains uh, and on those trains they had vents to atmosphere. They had double bursting discs. So if the bottom bursting disc goes, you've still got protection. You've got two bursting discs to protect. On one graphic, the two bursting discs were shown in grey. There are bursting discs there. They're healthy. That's great. On vent B, on train B, the bursting discs were fine. They weren't ruptured, but they were shown in an alarm condition. And it had been like that for years. The operators understood vent A in grey is healthy. If you look at vent B, red is healthy. It was because somebody had inverted the inputs for the bursting discs and so they were in the alarm condition. They didn't really think about it. The operators know that. That one's grey, that one's red. Don't worry about it. Yes, I said, that's great. But what happens when the bottom bursting disc on vent B ruptures? It will not alarm. It will clear the standing alarm that's at the bottom of several pages of alarms. It'll clear silently. The operator won't be informed of it. The earth only time you're going to find out about this is when the second bursting disc ruptures and all of a sudden you exceed your environmental consent and you get in trouble. And it will happen silently. You'll have lots of other alarms, but the operator won't know. Who's going to get wrong for not responding to the alarms? The operator. Have you helped him? No, you haven't. And this was like this for many, many years, apparently. So... At all stages of your alarm management journey, think about your operator. What is helping the operator? What works for the operator? Make sure your updates, your management of change works. Make sure that they don't have lots of alarms to deal with. Make sure that the alarms are the right ones at the right priority. So think about your operator. If you look after your operator, your operator doesn't have to service alarms, doesn't have to be reactive and just go, I, all I need to do is wait for an alarm. He can actually manage your process better, which will help improve your quality. So that's a good place to be. So think operator at every step of the way in your alarm management journey. A well-managed alarm system, if you do it properly and you have all your management processes and practices and procedures in place and you robustly enforce them to make sure your system integrators do what you want, not what they want, you will have a reduced potential for harm to people, the environment, your assets, your reputation. Potentially reduction in regulatory intervention. For example, your bursting discs, They'll know about the first one. You won't vent to atmosphere when you shouldn't. You'll have fewer breaches of consent. Reduce the potential for prosecution for large fines, unwanted media coverage. You'll minimize unnecessary outages. I'm not saying it'll stop altogether, but you reduce the number of outages, which means instead of being shut down, you'll make the right product at the right time, at the right quality, you're less likely to lose customers. They're less likely to go elsewhere. And of course, fewer alarms means reduced operator stress. You don't have to shuffle the people about because this guy's gone off on the sick for six months because he's too stressed. And all of a sudden you find you don't have anybody knowledgeable or experienced to run the plant. Not a good place to be. Companies don't want people to be on the sick on stress with stress. So think about that. A well-managed alarm system is important and it helps your company your business 
A well-managed system should only have the alarms required to safely and effectively manage your process. Not all these valve limit switch open, close, don't need them, take them away. Just the ones you read to manage your process. If you look in the Amur guidelines, and I'm sure you guys will all have a copy of the third edition, I'm sure you have, and you know them very well. There are four core principles in the Amur guidelines. The first core principle is usability. And as you can see on the screen, the words say alarm system should be designed to meet the user's needs. What are the operator? What does the operator need to help him run the plant and operate within the operator's capabilities? No good giving him 50 alarms every 10 minutes. He can't cope with 50 alarms every 10 minutes. You need to have low alarm rates and things must be easy to understand. OK, tag names, make sure they're correct. Descriptors, make sure they're relevant and understandable, things like that. It all ties in alarm management. You need to think about your operator, not yourself. And that's the system integrator who said it makes it easy for me to do my job. Don't care. You need to think about how to make your operator's life much better. So is alarm management important? Yes, it is. It's very important. Managing alarms correctly is a really important thing to do and think operator what can i do to help my operator that will help the business in return it's not about giving the operators an easy life so they can just drink tea and read the paper that's not what i mean about making their job easy by making sure you have the right tags the right descriptors the right priorities you can make your life easy for your operator to manage your process safely and effectively so is alarm management important? Yes, it is. At that point, I'm going to stop talking and I'll hand back to Chris. If anybody has any questions, I don't know if there are any questions already come in, Chris. I shall hand back to your good self, sir. And thank you very much for your attention, no. guys. I hope I haven't bored you.